and in deed, when we look at the infrared, we see this is what we expected, but we also see a bunch of other stuff. And if I magnify that, these lines, if we trace the lines back, go to perfect vanishing point. So we've now learned that the artist made that pedestal by using the laws of perspective. Trivial, but we're the first people in the world that ever knew that. So ever since the artist covered it over, nobody has known that for 500 years. And now, with one click, in a 30 of a second, we've learned <coughs> that it's been hidden for 500 years. So I took this camera to the Hermitage, and there's our favorite painting, which was employed by Lorenzo Lotto. And I'll show you what we can extract from the, um, the painting in the infrared. In situ, it's on the walls of the museum. Now there's lots of things I could show you here, so I'm just gonna have you look at one thing for the moment. Notice he's wearing black, she's wearing black. Just kind of pay attention to her black robe. Different black. Lots of, uh, of story to go into beyond that, but that just shows you the infrared sees things that the visible didn't. Here's this octagonal pattern. In the painting, the distance from the front to the back is two and a half inches. It's this big. Let's see what goes on in that period of two and a half inches. This was the region I analyzed before, showing same color scheme, that first um, octagonal pattern. Let me bring this over here. And what I want to concentrate on for today's lecture is the um, geometrical pattern in the center. So let's look at that. Nice self-assured line. Refocus, bring this over. Abruptly, it's not like the lines sort of smoothly change from one kind to another, but right where I previously showed you completely independently, he had to refocus, causing the magnification to change by 13% to try to have him match a geometrical pattern after it's changed by 13% doesn't match. He struggles to try to make it look good. And he does as best he can. He's building up steam. He re doing okay. He refocuses again. And he gives up. <laughs> so in two and a half inches, three distinct types of lines. Again, more evidence that Lorenzo Lotto used optical projection. Let's look at this feature over here. This will be my unit cell. I'll bring that structure from the carpet over here, and I'll repeat it exactly a number of times, correct for perspective, and lay it back over on the pattern. Well, it fits extremely well back to here, but if I put the next one on, it doesn't fit at all. But if I correct for perspective, because I've had to move my lens, again, it fits. So right where you had to refocus, where the vanishing lines came, we see again that he used optics for that. And it's the same degree to a few millimeters. So I had a, uh, a um, John Chaddock, a master's student in art education, reproduce this. There's our triangular pattern, our octagonal pattern, one lens of a pair of spectacles. He's gonna project this onto a transparent, overhead transparency, paint it, and then overlay it on a life-size copy of the painting that's in my lab. So he projects the image onto his cam onto his uh, transparent overhead um, transparency, starts painting in the blue region, we're consistent with the colors. We'll jump ahead and finish the blue region. Then when it comes time to refocus on the green region, the lens has to come closer to the canvas, reducing the magnification by the 13% to match it up, paints in the green region. So he's all done refocusing one more time, you know, we'll see how well this fits to a life-size copy, one-to-one -one reproduction of the painting to the red region. Finish the red region. And it fits perfectly. So did he use optics? Of course he did. <laughs> and so just go to my webpage to look up uh, art-optics.com. One last quick example, um, the Arnolfini, Mary, uh, sorry, uh, Cardinal Albergati, I think he's hiding something from us. We're gonna try to see if he really does. <laughs> There's a drawing and a painting of Cardinal Albergati that I've reproduced at the correct relative scale. The drawing is 40% of the size of the, 40% smaller than the size of the painting, but they look pretty similar. 
when he magnified them to the same size, they look really similar. I'll make one semi-transparent and overlay it. Now, two things we know. One is, looks great here, but it's off there. <coughs> Optics explain both. If I magnify this face even further, every feature, every wrinkle, every warp agrees to sub-millimeter precision. Finer than your pencil lead, or as fine as your pencil lead. How did Van Eyck do that? And there's the drawing, pres the, presumably the cardinal page for this painting, and I can tell you reasons why he ended up making a drawing first this size. Well, he's got the problem. He's got a drawing that's this big, you can't <coughs> color in the, the painting, because the cardinal page will lift. And you don't mess with the cardinal. So he's got to do this. He can stick the um, drawing in the same optical setup, uh, the identical optical setup as he used to produce the drawing in the first place, to a simple concave mirror, magnified by 40%, and he's done. But he runs into the same kind of problem, which I've had to simulate for you. There's only a certain region that has uh, the field is good enough for him to make use of. Well, we'll do what um, Lorenzo Lotto did. We'll fill in what we need there, then translate the drawing and the canvas sideways, fill that in. Now, we're not going to die. The Cardinal's not going to execute it because we've managed to make this 40% larger. We fill in the air. Everything is going great. We do the last of the hair. And then what I'll do is overlap this on a, the painting at real size. And it's perfect. So optics both gave us the incredible fidelity, but it was responsible for making these mistakes where he misregistered it by a couple millimeters. And this is just the last segment. And again, John fills in the last little piece and overlays that on a life-size copy of the painting which he's done and reproduced exactly the way I've just shown you. It had to be done. Moves it to match the hairline, fills in the, the last of the hairline, and then overlays it on a life-size painting. The ear, the hair. Almost done. And the fit is perfect. Again, optics explain everything. So if, if artists started using optics in 1425, when did they stop? Um, I'm going to show you, every painting I'm going to show you, we've extracted evidence that optics were used. And um, I'm going to cover from 1425 to present, and we're going to do it in 17 seconds, or 18 seconds. So if you blink, you'll miss a century of art history. <laughs> and all of these paintings are by Bellini, Caravaggio, Van Eyck, uh, Van Dyck, the main brand artists of Western European art. And they go by faster than I could possibly name them. My Dino, Lotto, uh, Holbein, Caravaggio. And during chronological order, you know, probably probably space and time. And the answer is artists never stopped using optics. They've used optics continuously since it first started. A quick jump to the future. We can do the same thing in the ultraviolet. I saw me an ultraviolet camera, so I'm just going to jump past. Things look different in the ultraviolet. If you're a bee, this is what you see, that you see in the ultraviolet. So what we're doing now with NASA is um, making a focal plane array with different filters on it that will go onto a uh, rocket. And it all goes well. 22 years from now, we'll take a picture, hopefully more than one picture, of uh, one of the moons of Jupiter. By then, if it doesn't work, they'll never be able to track me down to say your filter didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so quick summary, <coughs> overwhelming scientific <coughs> evidence, only a tiny fraction of it able to show you in the time tonight that optics were used to create portions of features of certain paintings. They're not photographs. <coughs> That's essential to remember. Optics don't make marks. They provide a way of seeing for the artist, a registry for the artist, an optical perspective, but the artist can choose to ignore what he doesn't like. And it does um, allow remarkable insights into aesthetic choices. 
where I'm able to show optics was used, and I can show you that the artist did something different than the projection looked like, that's a aesthetic decision somebody as famous as Van Eyck made. So we can ask questions about what artists were thinking and answer them. And these are questions that nobody even thought that they could even begin to ask prior to optics. It does fundamentally affect our understanding of, of art. The sudden transition to realism was noticed, but nobody knew why. We know why. And there's a lot of applications to photography and computerized image analysis. Here's what's so revolutionary about what you're saying. You're saying the history of art, the history of the Renaissance, is the history of optics. I am saying I know that, that. and you're, you're blowing everything up. You're blowing everything that all of us who took <laughs> art appreciation <laughs> study, all the art historians have written, and you're saying you're all wrong. It's all about optics. <laughs> 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 and it is a paradigm shift. It's a shift in understanding, applying our optics knowledge to extract things about the most iconic works of Western art. This is the end. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. <laughs>